There's a lot I want to say here today. I took the time to write it so I don't forget anything. Please bear Do me with me. a favor. Read slow. Please so bear the with me. Reporter gets everything, okay? Please bear with me because this will take a lot of time, but there is a lot I need to say. Before I read what I wrote, I want to go backward for a moment and share some of Lynn's words. Days after Lynn died, I found a large envelope full of letters in all of Lynn, in all of all from Lynn, ten in total written to my mom, Jenny, Anthony, Kareen, Jim, Judy, Jean, Keith, Lisa, Scott, and I, all dated between September 3rd through the 16th, 2018. These letters contain personal things as well as things I have never known. These letters were admitted and published to the jury and briefly mentioned during sentencing, at which time some called them goodbye letters and others said suicide letters. But nothing was read from them or shared, and as I sit here today, I want to be able to share two of hers before my own. The first is what she wrote to me that was Defense Exhibit 506, starting with page 18. Dusty, I love you as if you were my own child. There is so much you don't know, so much most people would not understand about me. I have concealed so many secrets that the guilt is too much to carry any longer. My dad was my world, and when he died, a part of me died with him. Life wasn't what it, what it once was. My loss turned to depression that was a daily struggle inside me, to where I tried to numb the pain with drinking combined with my prescriptions to forget life. Times used to be much simpler than today. Madison is where I was raised and where I had called home until I was kicked out of town. My dad has never been so disappointed in me as he was that day. He eventually forgave me, but not my mother. I was forever a disappointment in her eyes, and she never let me forget it. Back then, I first got into heavy drugs, and for that, I needed money. A friend and I began getting high and robbing homes, we mostly stole checks to obtain money. Remember years back when I went to prison for stealing from, remember years back when you went to prison for stealing from your mom and grandma? I was so disappointed in your behavior because I stole from strangers, not family. As I said, times were different back then. My punishment was that I had to leave Madison, my home. My mistakes have cost me my whole life. I have done the same things over and over for so long, looking for a different outcome. In the end, it is just a slow walk to the bitter, sad truth of regret that weighs heavily on me, where I foresee no future left. As much as I have tried to move forward with my personal demons, like to come trampling into my dreams of fear, loneliness, despair, and death, upon leaving Madison, I became only more heavily involved in drugs. I have tried every drug, my favorite heroin. It was such a push. I'm so proud you never seemed interested in drugs. Don't start now. The drugs today scare me too, too many people experimenting with people's lives. For me, it was all about drugs and money, how to get more of both and not get caught. I have spent years trying to figure out that out. Twice I was close to robbing a bank. I used to watch a bank in McGuanagoe for so long, I actually thought I could pull it off, but never move forward in my plans. Later, going to prison myself was a wake-up call until I found out my dad died and I couldn't go to the funeral. I snapped. Everything changed. Doubt, speculation, confusion. Sure, I filled the voids best I could looking for any way to avoid the inevitable, but no matter what I did, my dad was still gone and I was still in prison. Another failed mistake and this time there was no goodbye. I withdrew, shut down, my anxiety was maxed. I was paranoid of everything and everyone. I had COs and inmates out to get me on a daily in prison and no one believed or helped me. I was released as a different person. I never went back to my passion of hair. I drank myself into deep depression and began the drugs again when the prescription didn't seem to work. As you have heard, my mom and I were never close like your mom and you. But like you, I was an only child like you, so when my mom first started to need help and started to forget things, I was there. I began helping her and going up every couple of days. I thought she would maybe, be, I thought she would be better with me. If anything, things were only worse and harder. She remembered enough to remind me I was a mistake, how my dad believed my lies and wasted money time and time again and how my father went to an early grave because of my inc incarceration. 
It was hard on me, and I was conflicted because my duty was to care for her, but it was emotionally tough on me. Over time, I got a better understanding of my parents' finances, and what's truth was why I continued to help when I didn't want to. In my eyes, we were both failures, her as a mother and me as a daughter. I ultimately couldn't be around her anymore, listening to her accusations of me stealing from her. She kept threatening to change her will, and I was not going to lose the money I felt entitled to. I don't really know where our relationship went wrong, but in the end, I said and did things I can't take back. I live with it every day, and it haunts me. I had no right. I was raised better than this, and I am, not taking, I am now taking full responsibility, as I should have years ago. I spend every day with regret, worry, and dread. I have not total soul the truth until now. Although KD did figure out some, while we were high together, I'll explain more on that later. I have been doing daily, I have been afraid daily of being arrested for her death. I cannot go back to prison. I lied to everyone about everything for so long to oblige my own selfishness. I tried to build up the courage to confide in your mom or you so many times, but I couldn't put that on either of you. My mom was sick and dying. I helped her along two days before she died. I spiked her hot tea with water and 12 bottles of IZ. I saw a TV show where a girlfriend tried to kill her boyfriend, that there's a chemical in it that's deadly. Her boyfriend didn't die. She was charged. My mom was never my dad, but what I did was wrong. I believe all, all of my ailments of sickness sense is payback for all of my wrongs I have done in life. I was senile to believe I could do something like this without consequences. Do you remember after her death, your mom came up to help me pack up the house? I couldn't be there alone, and she woke up to me destroying the basement. My mom came to me that night, and it scared the shit out of me to where I never slept the same again. I drink with too many prescriptions to numb the pain until I would black out for the weight of my wrongs is heavy, way too heavy to deal with. I sit in misery and self-pity reflecting on my life, for I have helped, borrowed, and gave everyone trying to build forgiveness for my actions. I thought I would be happy having more money, bought the condo, sold my parents' home, closed my mom's estate. This condo was a huge mistake. I hate it here. The neighbors are not friendly. One admitted he thought I was a drug dealer. Do not keep this condo. Sell it and take the money and run. Had it not been for the rambling to KD, I would have had the money to get out here. Maybe even get the side by side with your mom. The aftermath of my breakdown with KD was my next nightmare. He was the one person who knew enough about my mom's death and my hand I played in it. He blackmailed me for almost a year and was terrified. I was terrified with anxiety. Do I keep paying him for his silence? Remember all those checks I wrote you? That was why. He tapped me out a large chunk of my inheritance but kept me from prison. Never, never tell your secrets to your drug dealer, ever. Afterward, it ruined all my plans. I had planned on saving. My saving grace was when Katie overdosed and died, before I was broke. That's when I became obsessed with trying to build my nest egg back up. I cheated the system any way I could. My credit has never been better thanks to a new life of money. I got every credit card I wish I could with limits I never had, lines of credit and loans. My plan was always to max out debt before I die and live it up. I learned with my mom's estate by attorney Bob Gonzalez that you only pay the creditors that file a claim. If they don't file or they aren't, they are out of luck. Keep that in mind when you handle my estate. Jesse, listen to me when I say, use the new will. Anthony doesn't need the money. I want it to go to you. I have spent months lying to you about everything, and you deserve it, <coughs> and so much more for putting up with me. I only wish I could do more. You are hard-headed like your mother, and if you still insist on Anthony being a part of the old will, then remember to try Anthony in the estate and see what he does. See if he helps you. See if he fights you on issues. Put an ad in the paper for the creditors. Only pay the creditors that file a claim. Give Anthony 10000 15000 Make accounting paperwork to match, showing the account. Wait two to four months and decide and see what Anthony does or says. Then either correct paperwork or file by Anthony. Half or do correct paperwork, file new will, removing him. Contact Bob with any help or issues. But word of advice, easier to submit new will. 
I know Keith, Jim, or Corrine will fight you every step of the way, and my influence, Anthony, too. Do not let them walk all over you. I left you in charge because can handle it. I do not want Jim or Keith in the condo. I am not trying to control how you handle things. I just want to help and prepare you for them so they don't walk all over you. I have argued with you many times about my will. I know you always hated talking about it, but remember, I prepared everything so you wouldn't have, some paper, so you wouldn't have the paperwork mess I had to deal with. I want you to live without the worry and stress because you and you alone have been here. When, when I've been at my worst, I have had enough money for a cushion for you, but to listen to me here, I, kn I know you don't want to upset anyone, Anthony, Anthony, but that's not on you. I changed my will because I wanted to. It's my wishes. Jesse, I've cheated, lied, and stole my whole life, and for me, I would do it all over again the same way because I loved it. I don't want that for you. I know you've grown past all that. I can see how happy you are and lovey-dovey with Scott. I hope one day you have a child of your own because you are an amazing mom to his kids. I want to take my mom's antique charm bracelet to pass it on to your family. Kids were never in my cards. I had abortions because I wasn't ready. You are the closest to my own. I love you as if you were my own and hope you know that. You have been my rock. You are always here for me, and you're more, and you never complained. The reason I've told you things I never wanted you to know is because I don't ever want you to be like me. I have done so many things I am not proud of. Looking back, I should have been locked up for life, and that's half of why I can't do this anymore. I'm so sorry for the messes I have caused you along the way. The pain in your ass I have been, and all the lies I told you, and mostly for putting you in many uncomfortable positions for me. I am sorry I asked you to help me die. That look in your eyes when I asked was enough to know that it was a mistake to ask, and you would not help. I want, you, I want your mom and you to be okay when I am gone. I have done all I could to help and take care of you both. There will be even a few more surprises before I am gone. Jesse, I am not proud of the mistakes. Lord knows I have more than I can bear anymore, but I am so proud of you. You were stupid young and had mistakes, and you turned your life around. You learned from it. I'm scared daily of the things I have done. I don't know what I did with that. I don't know what you did with that gun you took away from me. That was beyond stupid, but I hope you got rid of it. I don't need you getting in trouble because of me. Truth is, that was the second gun from both the same place a few weeks apart. I drilled the hole incorrectly in the first. Being a felon buying that gun the way I did, I kept waiting for the police to show up. I am sorry about the lying and damage I have caused these past few months. I don't know how to make that right. I worry about your mom, too. I wish she'd find a decent guy like you. Whatever you do, I know you will help your mom, and I want you to, but do not let her even know what you obtained when the estate is closed. I don't give her, and don't give her too much at once. I'm sure you know, just like I used to, I'm sure just like I used to worry about you when you first got out of prison, your mom isn't good with money. Remember that credit card I had for her for emergencies? She always racked it right up. More, none of us ever have been good with money, the more I think about it. I never had so much fun racking up my credit cards these past few months. I wanted to make sure you were out of debt and could build for your future. I am only sorry I lied about it to you with the cancer. I had reasons for all I did. I just didn't know at the time. I hope you understand and forgive me one day. Make sure you talk. take the swan ashtray from the bathroom and the old pinball game in the bottom dresser drawer. Throw away my drug stash, dining room putch. My important papers are together and also my lockbox. Make sure you think about all I said. Anthony will take extra care of your mom. Remember the good days, not the bad. I love you, Jesse. Love, Lynn. September 16, 2018. Destroy this letter after reading. I don't want everyone to know the things I have done and told you. No good would come from it. The other I want to share is the last known letter Lynn wrote and was dated October 1st. 2018 and goes along with the tape recording she made, which was buried in Whitnall Park, that was defense 
Exhibit 506, starting on page 26. Jesse, I am sorry to leave you like this, and I am assuming you will be the one to find me. After all you have done for me, all the times you have saved my life, I know if it wasn't for you, I would have been dead months ago. You have been my rock. You're stronger than anyone I know, and I, I know, and now I need you to take care of your mom for me. I know you did all you could to keep me alive as long as you could. I no longer recognize myself. I am sick of being sick, complaining about being sick, and just sick of it all. I want to be free from the pain, and this is my time. I love you and your mom very much. Take care of each other. I am following the yellow brick road to see my dad. Jesse, stop listening to this tape and put it safe and hidden. Island Hernan, being of sound mind and body, want to state, I record this statement of record today, Sunday, October 1st, 2018. I have been sick long enough, seen enough doctors to know that I will never be the same, and I no longer want to live my life as it is. I have done things that I cannot take back. I took a life that I had no right to do. I am choosing on my own free will and my own time frame to take my own life. I have tried more options than most would know, from purchasing a gun, overuse of medications, to poisons. I assumed poison would be the fastest and easiest. Little did I know it would be just as hard. Visine is one I stumbled across prior and tried without success, but ended up using it. Now for almost three months, the way it makes me feel is something undescribable. My body is numb. I feel no pain from my constant pain, and it makes me tired where I have a sleep where I sleep a kind of sleep I haven't experienced in years. I became quite fond of it. It was a new medication to me. I enjoy my medications, and now Vitazine has become one of them. I first, at first, I was drinking a bottle almost daily mixed in my water or vodka, then increased over time. I was purchasing Vizine on my own for over a month until I could no longer drive or shop. I did stock up on it and had my caretaker, Jesse, did not know what I was doing with the Visine until recent. Jesse is one person in the whole world who knows everything I have went through and out except my mother's death. Seen all the good and bad, she has been there when I fell in the middle of the night, shit on myself or puked and came to clean it up. She caught me in the act of trying to take my own life. She has seen me at my worst and there regardless. I owe her everything for all she has done. Her mother, my best friend, and Jesse are my only family left and mean more than I know. I did the unthinkable to Jessie, and it ruined her. For months I lied to her, and I had her lie to everyone in the process. It destroyed her. She knew I was suicidal, but I told her I was sick and dying from colon cancer. I didn't want to see people or talk to them, so I had Jessie lie to everyone. I didn't want anyone to know. Truth was I was sick of, with colon cancer. Truth was I wasn't sick with colon cancer or dying. One afternoon, Jessie came to check on me, as her usual, caught me unexpectedly while I had a gun to my head. She screamed at me, crying, that when I came clean with her about not having cancer and lying, I lied to her because she was so concerned about being suicidal that saying I was sick was easier to do. I never seen, seen her so hurt, saying I was sick was easier. I'd never seen her so hurt, and she lied to everyone. She knew and didn't know what to do now. She told me that I was either going to get help or go to the hospital, and she was calling the cops. I let her take me to the hospital the next morning where they admitted me, and I stayed for weeks. I wanted to get better for her, but deep down my decision was made long ago. I cannot go on anymore. My mom's death haunts me daily. I tried to take my life twice while in the hospital. I had a camera put in my room. After arriving home from the hospital, Jesse stayed the weekend, and per my discharge, I was to get in home, in home care that week. I had planned on different ideas, but Jesse did not leave me alone, ending the weekend. Came and went, and now it's Sunday morning. I took all of my remaining Visine bottles and put them into my last water bottles. I have stashed Visine for months and been emptying over time to the water bottles. I now have three bottles filled with only Visine, over 30 bottles, and will start drinking those tomorrow along with my medications. I am hoping that by drinking an extreme amount, this will look, work as planned. I am choosing this on my own terms and how I see fit. No one played any part in this decision or acted in it. I have chose to drink Visine to end my life. 
Look into my mother's death to better understand. I came into this world fighting like hell and lived a good life, and I am going out of this world on my own terms. Soon I will see my dad again. I would like it known that Jesse and Jenny are in charge of my final wishes. They know where the paperwork is and what to do. I want to make sure it is known in case she doesn't listen because she didn't want any issues. I changed my will in July 2018 to remove Anthony and Corrine Poza, along with a letter as to why. They haven't been my friends or hear from me. Do not let them, but keep their nosy asses out of my shit. I want to thank Jean for all of her help. Judy, I am sorry. I know you strongly disagree with suicide. Keith, I love you as a brother, but do not want you to obtain the bracelet that matches your necklace. I helped you and gave you your gift prior. That was between us. Jim, I don't want you to get a thing of mine, and I don't want you or any of you in my condo. I made a list of items for you in the last year with others. To date, you owe me a ton of money. That list is now null and void. Fuck you all. None of you gave a damn about me, and it was about what I could do for you, or no contact at all. Jenny and Jesse, I am sorry for everything. I hope you know I will no longer be in pain and be with my dad watching The Wizard of Oz. There is no place like home. Sorry, most of this is terrible to read, and I made a tape after I wrote it. Lynn, I sent you your mom a rent payment and car payment. You will also relieve a check to buy until the estate is settled. Two days later, on October 3rd, 2018, I was with her in the morning. I left to run some errands and to return later in the day to find her dead and life forever changed in that instant. I will fill in some gaps shortly, but I wanna fast forward nine months to July 9th, 2019, where I was arrested and have been in custody ever since. I was first revoked and sent to prison for almost two years on decade-old forgery charges for assisting in her suicide. On June 4th, 2021, the day before I was to release from prison, I was charged with first-degree intentional homicide and thefts. I was transferred to Waukesha County Jail, where I have remained incarcerated two and a half years on a million-dollar bail awaiting trial. It has now been over five years since her death, and some days it feels like yesterday, others it's as if all time stopped, or others I feel as though I've been locked up forever, screaming and fighting, while nobody is listening or doing anything in this reoccurring nightmare, only to wake up and realize it is my life. Early on, I was silenced by a protective order, meaning I wasn't allowed to speak out. Then I chose, after many conversations with my attorneys, not to take the stand, which I deeply regret. It was a huge mistake in my eyes. I went against what I have always said and believed for people who are innocent when I didn't testify. Due to us not understanding, my mother was not able to take the stand because we were talking daily about all that was happening during trial, which nobody got to know. I sat here every day during my trial listening while everyone talked about Lynn, my mom, and I, like they knew us, and I bit my tongue, which is extremely difficult. And today as I sit here at my own sentencing, again I have listened to everyone else talk, and now it is time to do what I want, what I need to do, and what I should have done long ago. It is time to speak out. There is a time for everything, a time to be silent, as I was, and a time to speak, as I am now. I want, I want it, I know it doesn't matter what I say here today. It won't change my conviction or what you already decided for my sentence or what people may think of me, but these things I need to share and say because there was and is so much to this case. First though, before I forget, I want to take the time to thank the jurors, the witnesses, court officials, from reporters, clerks, deputies, everyone and anyone involved in this case for their time, as it was very consuming. I also want to thank all of the attorneys I have had and you, Judge Doro. I have waited years for this trial and the truth to be known, but they got it wrong because nobody got to hear even half of what really happened. Nobody got to know the real story or even the real us for that matter. Everyone on the state side gave the jury and everyone else who didn't know us preconceived notions of what our relationship was with Lynn. And the truth is, they didn't know her and they didn't know us to know any of that. Lynn was our family. Lynn was my mom's best friend. She was who my mom called for anything and everything. For me at times, Lynn was a second mom or Aunt Lenny or sometimes my best friend. She was all in one. At times, we were closer than I was with my own mom and some of my own family. Sometimes I went to her before my mom or for things I couldn't or didn't want to go to my mom for. 
I want you to actually get to know who Lynn was as a person, the Lynn that I knew, the Lynn I grew up knowing most of my life, the Lynn I loved and cared for as my family, the Lynn I saw and was there for those days, daily for those last few months, versus the Lynn prior. Lynn loved to live life to the fullest. She was outgoing, adventurous, talkative. She would talk for hours. It was a running joke because sometimes my mom would fall asleep while on the phone with her. She loved animals. There wasn't a stray or shelter animal she would turn away. At times, she'd have a bird or two, a dog here or there. She always had cats, at least two. Those were her favorite. Most were odd or had weird tics, homely looking, but she adored them. She gave them a home, and they were her babies. She loved Summerfest. It was her all-time favorite. She went every year. It usually opened on her days around her birthday. She used to go every day from morning to night, and she waited all year for it. She loved those summer festivals, watching all the live bands at the bars. She liked all different kinds of music, from ACDC, Lady Gaga, Pink, to Eminem. She loved black and white movies. It was one of her all-time favorites with Psycho Bates Motel, all others like Wizard of Oz, Sound of Music. She loved Marilyn Monroe, Betty Davis. Some of her favorite TV shows were So You Think You Could Dance, to Stars, Empire, she loved one of the main characters named Cookie, who played by Taraja P. Henson. Her fierce attitude, her style of clothes. She would call to make sure I was watching or saw the outfit she had on that day. And let's not forget her soaps, which she got me forever sucked into. General Hospital and The Bold and the Beautiful. She loved seafood, crab legs, and calamari to spinach and artichoke dips to a rare steak. If it was sunny, you'd find her out in the water. Lake, pond, or pool, it didn't matter. She'd be soaking up the sun tanning on a floaty or in a paddle boat with her sunglasses on her head, a cocktail in hand, a usual favorite was vodka with a splash of Coke, and I can't forget she'd have a cool cigarette lit in the other. She was a big smoker, smoking up to three packs a day. She'd put one out within minutes, lighting another. She was all about her appearance, bleach blonde hair with her bangs curled two inches out, teased with so much hairspray they wouldn't move. She'd be tan, finger and toenails all painted, mostly neon bright colors, she wouldn't go anywhere without her lipstick on or high heel heels until she could no longer wear them. And lots of jewelry, big hoop earrings, rings, bracelets down both arms, and necklaces, mostly costume jewelry or family pieces, passed down. She came on field trips, school field trips as Auntie Lynn with bags of candy. Everyone loved her. She loved to dye my hair one color to the next, dress me up. I remember when I was younger, I would sometimes stay by her at night when my mom would work third shift. We'd watch MTV videos while eating snacks. When I came home from my dad's in Florida one year with lice, after my mom tried everything and couldn't get rid of them, ready to shave my long hair, as I sat crying, she called Lynn the beautician for advice and venting. She recommended kerosene, said it would hurt and burn, but they would be gone. She was right on all of those. In middle school, when I was having issues with some of the older girls, they came to my apartment looking for me, but she was there waiting for them. She tried, she was tired of the school not handling the problem, so she took it into her own hands and scared the crap out of them. Or when I was older, or when, or when she moved as I got older, friends and I would go over by her place after Skate U because she lived within walking distance. She was the cool aunt to hang out with. She would come to the campground by my mom and I where we would camp for drinks and bonfires, but leave at the end of the night because she wasn't a camper. She wanted her bed in a bathroom. My high school boyfriend and I would go out to her lake house on the weekends for swimming. She first taught me to drive, or should I say tried. She had a little red Fiaro, but we gave up laughing because I couldn't figure out stick shift. She was really teaching me to drive long before I was age. So when we went out to eat or to the bars around her old place on Lake Phantom, I could drive us back home because she would have a few too many. She took me to Planned Parenthood to get on birth control without my mom knowing for a whole year. She threw my high school graduation party at her lake house. My whole family came. She was so excited. She loved being the host of all hosts for any get together. She was known for cooking, appetizers, dips, Chex Mix, and so much more. She was a shopper. She had so much stuff, and she was always picking up more. She was a wheeler and dealer to get the best price. She loved going to Menards, Kohl's, Sally's, or even the dollar store. Those were just some of her favorites. My mom and her loved going to rummages on weekends. It was their thing. She loved shoes. She once had a pair that she liked. She would go back and get in every color. Anytime she found something, whether it was clothing, decorations, anything, she'd always go back and get a second for my mom or I or others. 
My mom and her have had so many of the same boots, coats, decorations, plants, and more. We spent holidays and birthdays together as family, and she went all out. She would get so excited and kept pulling out more gifts hidden away, it was overboard. She was good at picking out things you needed, wanted, or you knew you would like. She loved going out to eat at her favorite restaurants or meeting at her usual bars for drinks. She loved being the, being the beautician because she could make her own hours, working where and when she wanted. She never had a lot of money, but she was happy and did all she could for anyone. That was the Lynn before she went to prison for her fifth DUI, and it all changed. While there, she lost her dad. She was not able to be there with him, say goodbye, or go to the funeral. It crushed her, broke her, and she was sad, angry, and depressed, and was put on medication. She came out a totally different Lynn than we ever knew or saw. The only one constant was her drinking before and after. That stayed the same. She drank a lot. Maybe, if anything, it got worse after, because she wasn't doing much outside her home. Even when she was on extended supervision, she drank. She had bottles hidden around her apartment, so when she had home visits with her agent, they wouldn't find them. I know this because even when I was there, at her apartment off of Sunset Drive in Waukesha, the first place she got after prison, back then I was even helping drive her around to doctor's appointments and other things. That was in 2016. Little known fact, people who knew Lynn knew she hated Waukesha. She was living there because she was on supervision. Later, after her mom died, she purchased a, a, a Pewaukee condo. Her realtor pushed reluctantly because it was on the edge of Waukesha. She chose it. She got disability and never went back to work. She didn't like being around people, and she withdrew. She became a hypochondriac, anxious, paranoid, ergo insomniac, and would only leave the house at certain times. Her health changed, as did her attitude and appearance. She would call us at all times, talking for hours about nothing and everything, sometimes making no sense at all and completely drunk. She would sleep two to four hours and be awake, wide awake, staring at her, starting her day at 3, 4 a.m. outside, doing gardening or running errands, and home before 8, 9 in the morning, done for the day. Sometimes she would be drinking at all hours of the day and would be drunk by 8, 9, 10 a.m. Even her neighbor, Jean, testified. They had stopped regularly talking because of Lynn's drinking and an incident from when she was drunk. Another fact of Lynn, from the old apartment to the new condo, after some incidents there, she had also hid some of her alcohol bottles. If you remember, the deputy medical examiner testified about finding two bottles of vodka in the garbage. Lynn had two large garbage bins that she used for storage. They were never for garbage. She put towels, dishcloths, etc., and her vodka bottles, so they were out of sight. She used a plastic pick-and-save bag on the closet door handle of garbage and daily threw it in the large garbage bin in the garage. I also remember about six months or so before she had passed, I had went out to her condo with a friend whom she had never met. I was picking up a piece of furniture. We had went on a weekend morning, early, like 9, 10-ish, and she was drunk when we had got there. Offered us a drink and asked him if he had wanted some pills she didn't want. From her mom's death, she came into money. I never knew, nor was it my business, what she had got from her mother's estate. But due to this case, the money aspect, Lynn's letters, and her, and her mother's death, I pushed my attorneys to look into it. According to the estate papers, her mother died without a will. The only heir was Lynn, leaving her as the sole beneficiary, which was odd because Lynn's letters state her mother was going to change her will to remove her. And then when the de detective spoke to the cousin John, he stated another family member who was also an attorney handled the family's wills, yet he wasn't the one who handled her mom's estate. That leaves some more, answered, answer, more unanswered questions. I also know, Worthy, her mom's estate left around $140,000 that went to Lynn. So how did Lynn buy a condo that she paid cash for and have $250,000 left to open a bank account, both right after her mother's death? Again, you heard her own words on how she was stealing from her mother while caring for her. Her mother found out, and that is why she changed her will, yet no will was probated. It's very frustrating. Everyone dug into Lynn's, my mom's, and my own financials between 2016 to Lynn's death, but nobody looked prior into Lynn's or her mom's bank accounts to verify or even discredit her letters or to see when she came into that money, where exactly it all came from, and how, or how Lynn had that kind of money. The state tried to say I stole over $500,000 from Lynn. Even the jury did not believe that. The problem the only record obtained was her mother's estate, and it was during trial, and my attorneys never brought it up, so the jury never got to hear any of this. The state said 
they got records to review Lynn's spending habits and patterns, yet they didn't bother looking into prior to 2016. They only saw when she had money, not when she didn't, nor when she lived paycheck to paycheck, later behind on bills, or when she had no credit cards or no credit. It all changed when her mom died at the end of 2013. The only reason she even had an account at BMO Harris Bank was because that was where her mom banked. I bet if anyone looked at her mom's account her last year's live, you would notice some changes. If I had to guess, she was even added on her mom's account as a second signer, and money was taken and moved around. The day Lynn died, detectives took lots of photos. One was of a handwritten letter by Lynn to an employee from BMO Harris, who also was one of our defense witnesses. Lynn wrote her thanking her for all of her help with her mom's stuff. When my attorneys first spoke to her, she remembered Lynn until right before trial, an attorney for BMO Harris got involved. And due to her being a witness for an alleged murderer who is all over the TV, nobody wants to be involved, let alone in business. So it all changed. She didn't remember Lynn, and she would only verify her signature and notary stamp. Lynn knew this person, dealt with her regularly to the point of writing her and talking about her. Doesn't anyone care to know the truth about any of this? Since this changes everything. She told her own truth in her own letters, but nobody, the detectives, the state, even my own attorneys, ever looked into any of it. The detectives had a person to pin her death on, and that was me, case closed as far as they were concerned. Clearly, she got way more money that ever went through her mom's estate, and it wasn't from life insurance because she didn't have any. So where did it come from? What happened to Lynn's mom's will? Yes, this all matters because she took her mom's life and it haunted her to where she took her own. She stated that. I have every right to be upset, frustrated, irritated by all of this. I didn't do this and nobody is giving a damn to look into what really happened. Her own letters said to look into her mom's death to understand. Even with the money, she was still on disability and still got aid from the state. She knew what and how to do things to avoid detection from the state. She was on Medicare, Medicaid, energy assistance, food share, and more. She was adamant how she moved money and what she paid from what account. Also after her mom's death, when she first started doing her own will and other important decisions, writing constantly, talking about all of it, and changing it. It was very odd, not normal, comfort, normal conversation, and made all of us uncomfortable. I wasn't listed on her first will when it was done because I was in prison. She wanted me to be out and to see how I would do before, and she changed shortly after. Everyone said during trial I reemerged or came into her life in 2016. Neither is true. I have known Lynn since I was little. That was proven during trial and when we first met and became friends and family with Lynn, and that never changed. We didn't drift apart. We didn't stop talking. I didn't reemerge or any of that. I was released from prison in 20, February 23rd, 2016. I, because my criminal complaint states on count two between January 2016 to October 3rd, 2018. Yet I was in prison till February 23rd, 2016. I did not reemerge in her life. I was in it prior, during, and after my incarceration. If anything, we were only closer because we had both in prison time, so we could relate and knew other things others did not from going through that. She talked to me on the phone. We wrote. She sent, mo I sent, she sent money while in prison, just like I did while she was. When I got out, she helped me rebuild, get on my feet, and start over. If she didn't want me around as others claim, why did she call me and more than anyone else? Why did she put me and my mom on everything? Do you really believe over three years, as the state claimed, I stole over $100,000 in checks written to me, a loan, credit cards, and she wouldn't have known or seen? No way. Do you know how many times my name was listed on her medical records from those two-week hospital stays she had five days before she passed? 43 times. 43 times. Yet Jim, her ex-boyfriend, took the stand and said she called him from the hospital. She didn't want him around her in her condo. How she had met us, how she had just met us, and that she was in rehab for alcoholism. Okay, that's right. He would know since he didn't even know she was in the hospital. Nor did he have to have know anything or have anything to do with alcohol. He didn't regularly talk to her, and I have pictures that my attorneys didn't bother showing or asking Jim about. He knew me and my mom, and they were with us in Christmas when, we, when I was a little girl in our apartment. None of it makes sense. Lynn always loved Jim and cared dearly for his mom, Judy. He was the one who borrowed money from her all the time, and when he lost his grandma's house to foreclosure, she helped him pay for it. 
She helped him pay for hotels to live in. She helped him get his new house, even helped pay for his pool. When he went to jail, she bailed him out, paid his fines. I know this because she talked about it all the time. She hated cops, jails, courthouses. They made her nervous from her conviction and her incarceration. So when he called her, it was very hard for her to go there, and she went. He owed her lots of money to the point where when she left, she left information on it, letters expressing her frustration. She complained regularly in conversations about it and was upset he wasn't paying her back. He was the ex-boyfriend from back in the day who she really did love. They bar hopped, rode around together on his bike, partying while using drugs and alcohol. He lied to the police and on the stand about all of it. He is now sober, and that is only because he has no choice. If he wants to live, it is for his health. He was such a big drinker prior, and that is what happened. Another friend, Keith, was Corrine's brother, who wouldn't talk to the police but had no problem going on camera with the media, used drugs and alcohol with her also, who Lynn called her partner in crime in letters, but yet I am the one making all this up. I really have no reason to. It is not my intent to talk bad about Lynn. She is no longer here and cannot defend herself. I get that. Everyone makes mistakes and has things they aren't proud of in life. I want her to be remembered for her. I want people to know her, but I want people to know the truth. Lynn did not hide from her truth ever. Everyone who knew her knew that. She talked openly about drugs, alcohol, partying, her past record, past mistakes, all of it because as she has said, she had lived one hell of a life and wouldn't change a thing. Those were her words. When she used to talk about all the things she had done, you heard about all my bad, and it isn't right not to hear about some of hers, since some of it affected her and her own death. These people weren't there. I was. I went to see her daily when she was in the hospital. I called her there. I spoke to the staff in person and on the phone daily. They all knew me. Jean came to the hospital to see her. Judy, Jim's mom, talked to her while she was there because I told her when she called, like anyone else who called, even though Lynn didn't want them to know, I still told them. It was the same way with Jim's girlfriend. She found out when she called. They, didn't, they still didn't call or go see her after finding out. I told them she was in the hospital, even after Lynn asked me not to. I picked up her prescriptions with and without her. The pharmacy knew me. I went to pick and save with and without her. Her friend Lori, who worked there, also knew me. Some bank employees from her bank knew me, her jeweler, neighbors of her, and more, because I was the only one regularly around, just as I was the one she called when she found a Jeep to purchase. She had taken it, taken in her prior Jeep for service and ended up, while it was being serviced, found and purchased a newer Jeep. I was the one who she called when she needed and took, I was the one who took care of her and helped her. I was also the one who took care of her animals too. It was I who she called when she fell, needed a ride, needed anything, or just to talk. Do you know how many times I stopped whatever I was doing and drove out because she fell, needed water, cigarettes, vodka, wanted to go to the ER, wanted mozzarella sticks, a gyro with extra tzatziki sauce from Arby's, or a taco dip from Pick and Save, because that's what she liked. Whatever it was, I went, because that's what you do. I didn't say, hey, sorry, I'm out with Scott, or this or that. No, I went because she needed me. You know why she didn't call Karina or Anthony? Because they were too busy with school or work, and they had lives. That's what she said. She didn't call. They didn't call or come by her. She, she too, stopped calling them. It happens. People have lives with other priorities. I made the time. I was there. I answered my phone. She was sick, and she called me, or my mom, or Jean, her neighbor, and sometimes even Judy. I was also there spending time with her, watching her soaps, painting nails, having drinks, talking, and so much more. So when these people say I took advantage or that Lynn didn't want me around, it couldn't be further from the truth. During trial, it was brought up about what Lynn was and wasn't wearing the day she died. I want to get a few facts straight. Lynn didn't wear a bra or underwear, ever. And if you ever knew her, you would have known that. She didn't like them, nor did she own any. She used to wear swimming suit tops under her clothes in place of a bra, but hasn't done that in years. Her weight was constantly changing, and she was retaining water. She had been wearing loose-fitting and long, oversized T-shirts or button-up flannel shirts that she didn't have to pull over her head because it was harder for her versus unbuttoning, versus buttoning or unbuttoning, as well as putting on other things that were too tight. She didn't need or want to wear shorts or bottoms while she was home since the elastic at the weight was bothering her and irritating her dry skin, said it felt too restricted for her stomach. She was also on and off with hot flashes and preferred less close, period. It was easier for her when she used the porta toilet next to her because she had a hard time getting the shorts up and down without her falling. 
She did, however, keep a pair of large, loose-fitting shorts hanging on the bathroom door for when she needed. She had kept a blanket to cover up her waist and the top of her legs while sitting at home in her chair. She liked her feet always out from the blanket and never wore socks. And when the state said she would have had to put pants on if she was planning on committing suicide or knew somebody would find her, that is incorrect. She would not have. If anyone bothered to look at Defense Exhibit 541, page 1296, the hospital record shows under clothing what she was wearing when she was admitted. It says pants, shirt, footwear, no bra, no underwear. This was her, and she never cared about being naked, half naked, or who saw her like that. That is something that even her ex-boyfriend Jim should have known. And as far as her dad's dog takes, she always wore those. They made her feel close to him. These are things I know and most want. Do you want to know why? Again, because it was me that was there. I want to circle back to the pets part. My mother and I were portrayed as cat killers too. I didn't come up, what didn't come out and what was in Lynn's letters as she had left in defense exhibit 506, page one, was another letter. It was just to me about her cats and how she wanted to poison her cats with her or for her cats to be euthanized if she didn't end up poisoning them. I wouldn't euthanize them just because she died or wanted, nor would I give them to just anyone because they were older and they were used to being with just Lynn. I spent weeks checking out homes and people and wanted who wanted them and none were right. None of them felt comfortable for me to leave them with. So when I couldn't find the right home, we ended up taking them to join our four cats. Her so-called friend didn't step up, offer to check on them, feed them, or even take them. We did. Months later, one was euthanized because he was sick, and after taking him to the vet, it was the best choice since he was in pain and suffering. The other one died two years later. I just wanted to clarify that. We are huge animal lovers, just like she was. That was another incorrect jab the state had said in trial because they knew how it would make us look. People love pets, so they would hate us even more to see that in the media. Now, when Lynn was sick, she didn't call those so-called friends to help, be there, etc. They didn't even know she was in the hospital. Hell, they didn't even know her birthday when asked. One had a birthday gift still four months after her birthday. Clearly, they didn't see or talk to her regularly. I don't know why my prior attorneys didn't listen and get the phone records. I repeatedly asked, like so many other records not gotten, because it would have showed they all lied and about talking to her those last years. Can you please explain why I need to make this up? Because it could and should have been verified, and it will one day be proven. So yeah, maybe those people who took the stand claiming to be her friends were at some point, but they weren't close or around those, fa those last few years as we were. We were her family, and we were there. If they were such good friends, even if she didn't want them there, why didn't they care enough to try and be there or call her? And I still called these people to notify them of her death. They weren't concerned. They didn't question how she died or ask many questions about her death or funeral or this or that, except when can they come to her condo to get what they want and who's getting her bracelet. I ever never dealt with the death of someone, meaning handle the affairs, and I would never want to again. But what I can say, none of this was normal. She didn't want a funeral. She didn't want to be cremated. Like her parents, as it states in her own papers in Defense Exhibit 522, that would have never happened had I had known about all this was to come. I would have had her body autopsied again in a heartbeat. Days after she died, I went and picked up her jewelry from the ME's office because she was being cremated, and secondly, because everyone was fighting over that stupid bracelet. People were upset and fighting over her things of value. Nobody talked about her. Her own estate attorney, who actually knew Lynn, another person my attorneys never called to testify, knew of these issues because I was calling and emailing her all the time because I was sick of the arguing over that damn bracelet and the other stuff. I sold it. Yes, I did. And because that's what she told me to do. It wasn't sentimental or a family item. She bought it a year before her death. Do you know why she bought it and all the other jewelry? Because of one of her many credit cards had cut the limit in half from two hundred from no, from twenty thousand dollars to ten thousand because she wasn't using it. She was so upset, she called my mom and I screaming for hours about it. She wanted us to take a trip, go shopping, anything to rack up her credit cards because it was her credit and she wanted to use it when and how she wanted. So she went shopping. She bought lots of expensive jewelry. And if you don't believe me, it is on her credit card statement. State, states Exhibit 108, page 18, 22, 25, and 29. I know these things her so-called friends clearly did. 
There was no funeral per her wishes, but I had decided on a dinner at her favorite restaurant, Open Flame, to remember her and get to know and meet these old friends of hers. One didn't even want to go because he was mad over Lynn's bracelet because he said he was to get it, but I found paperwork that told me not to give it to him. Her own words and the letter stating he was not to get it after I had planned on giving it to him. In the last minute, he came and sulked the whole time. Other than that, we actually had a good time and enjoyed each other's company. Unlike what Jim said during trial, everyone talked of different stories and memories of Lynn while eating and drinking. We made possible future plans to get together for Lynn's birthday, put out some of her ashes, and talk about next steps. Lynn didn't want these people in her condo after passing. It was written on multiple things, and I still let them in. I had them all come out one weekend and pick up things they wanted, plus I had boxed up things she had originally wanted them to have as well. I tried very hard to get along with these people because they were at some point her friends. I didn't lie and say they weren't and make up things as they did to the police and during trial. Lynn didn't talk about these. Lynn did talk about these people. Judy, Keith, Anthony, Kareen, Jim. Yes, she did, and a lot. And she was also upset because they weren't around, and it wasn't just her doing. What people don't realize is Lynn was not the same person she was prior to prison. She kept changing. And for some, it was hard to be around her at times. And as people said, or as people do, they get busy. They have their own lives. It happens. You lose touch, out of mind, out of sight. And sometimes meaning to, without meaning to. And before you know it, it's been first weeks, then maybe months without talking. And time just gets away from you without realizing. Maybe that's what happened. I really don't know. But what I do know is that they weren't around or talking to her. Not to mention, where were those same friends when I spent four or five months cleaning and emptying her condo and doing all the work? Kareen did come and help at times, but she was the only one. Her and I regularly spoke and text for months about Lynn. Memories, the condo, really anything that made us think of Lynn or just checking in. We actually got along really well, and I actually liked her. These friends of hers wanted her stuff. They fought over it. You know what I wanted and still want? I want her here with us. I could give a crap about any of her stuff or her money for that matter. The state said it was all about money. That couldn't be further from the truth. If I wanted or needed money or anything else, all I had to do was ask and she would give it to me, no questions asked. I think that's what bothers me so much because I never stole from her. Even years ago, when I did use my mom and grandma's name in forgery charges, it's embarrassed sitting here talking about how shitty of a person I was years ago and the wrong I did to my own family. I am ashamed, and it was brought back up, but I also admitted it. I served my punishment, and I changed from that person, and Lynn knew that. I am not proud to be a felon, but I also own what I did. I have forgery and misappropriate ID use convictions, and now a decade later you are saying from that I turned into a murderer? There's no way. It's so far-fetched. So yes, it pisses me off, and I am outraged the state assumes as their motive I stole from her. I had no reason to steal from her. None. She isn't here, so she can't say I didn't, so it's my word against the state, and without, they have no case. But you can see if you really looked or tried. I did not steal over $100,000 from her bank accounts, credit cards, and she didn't see it over a three-year period. Her friend said she was talking about missing money. I'd like to know when, since they didn't talk to her, and she never reported it to the police or even her bank when she was in the bank weekly. Nor did she talk to me or my mother, who she would have spoke to if there was an issue, immediately. My own mom was on her accounts as a second signer, and no, that wasn't added as fraud by me, as the state tried saying either, considering she was added on January 4th, 2016, while I was still incarcerated, as it shows on Defense Exhibit 586, page 1, and 587, page 2. She never called questioning her credit cards. She paid the bills, but you're saying she didn't see your notice? Because you would have heard it, considering the state had phone calls on her credit card, State Exhibit 104 and 105, but none stating issues or fraud. For three years, she didn't see her statements, use the phone, go to the bank, or function. That's BS and you know it. She only stopped going out in her last month or two. And to say I killed someone who I considered my family, it just doesn't make sense. Lynn was very vocal. She did not hold back what she thought, ever. That is why I knew all about Jim and the money she gave him, because she was pissed and she talked about it frequently. If she thought I or anybody stole best believe, she would have done something and immediately. She didn't hold back. If she had something on her mind, she was going to tell you. And if she ever thought, as the state alleged, I was poisoning her for months or even years, 
she would and she didn't talk to anybody or suspect anything even to those doctors you want to know why because it wasn't happening she was no dummy as she would say you can't con a con one of her well known statements as i said she had her fair share of trouble and she didn't hide from it nor was she embarrassed by it she actually talked about it regularly to others so they would learn from her mistakes these so-called friends also said she would never commit suicide there were no signs they didn't believe it yet there were yet they weren't even around to know her or what was going on with her most people who commit suicide even the closest people around them say they didn't have a clue there were no signs like robin williams kurt cobain or twitch just to name a few well-known people who commit suicide for me suicide is hard to accept period Nobody wants to believe someone they know and love would commit suicide. I get that. I didn't either, and that's why I questioned everything. I called the medical examiner, but I sure as hell didn't go around accusing people of murdering her. I was there daily, and when I was asked if she was suicidal, I said yes and no because I did see some signs, and I truly believe if she really wanted to commit suicide, she would have months prior. She would go on and on about herself venting or telling you about this problem or that, all health related. And when you talked about your problems or what was going on, she would usually turn the conversation back to hers because hers were worse and I think she just liked to over exaggerate to appease herself. She kept doing weird things knowing I was coming out by her. So I assumed it was more of an attention thing. How do you think it makes me feel? That's the part I struggle with and feel guilty about because I didn't see it or believe it. I couldn't help what I didn't know. I knew she was frustrated and upset of not getting answers. She was tired of being sick. I didn't know she was lying to me when she said she was dying from cancer. Yes, I lied to people who didn't know her and at her request. In April 2018, she changed her living will to add me as it shows in exhibit states exhibit 17 and defense 607. Because she had finally got answers, she was sick and dying from colon cancer. It made sense. It fit her symptoms and issues she was having. And let's be honest, why would I think she was lying about cancer? She was so happy in a weird way because she had finally had answers. And as she had said, she didn't for so long. She didn't want anyone to know to talk her into fighting or feel sorry for her. So I lied. I also quit working at her request to care for her and to be there for her in what remaining time she had left because she wanted me there and I wanted to be there as it was my family. She had tried for months to take her own life. I would come out and find things or she would be doing things. It all made sense because she was in pain and dying according to her. She wanted the gun, so when she she wanted the gun, so when and if it got too bad, she could end it. We fought over that too. I didn't agree, but again, this was Lynn and she was an adult and she was going to do what she wanted to do. Can you tell me what you would do when somebody you know is sick and dying as she had, as she was see them day in and day out going through it? She asked me if I would help her die and when the time came and I couldn't and she couldn't take the pain anymore. I had said no because I couldn't and wouldn't be able to live with myself. It is not my place. I was not God. I have watched people sick and die from cancer. I have watched what it did to them and to the people they love and vice versa. It is a horrible thing. I couldn't even imagine the pain they are going through. Days prior to her two week hospital stint, her neighbor came over and said she had looked like the walking dead. I remember like yesterday, Lynn said, yeah, well, I wish I were. The reason she finally went into the ER was because I kept pushing her to go and get help. The day before I had walked in on her with a gun to her head, she was crying and babbling. She was not making sense to me and told me she had lied about having cancer. I told her this had gotten out of hand and she needed to go in for help. At that point, she had been drinking Visine for months. At first it was to take her life as she had did with her mom. I did not know either until after her death. She had continued drinking it because it took away or numbed her pain and helped her sleep. Those were her exact words. I know it sounds crazy. Who thinks to drink Visine? I had those same thoughts and lots more staring at her in shock. But you didn't know Lynn. You didn't see the things I saw her do, nor did you question her. Well, I did, but it didn't change anything. If she wanted to do something, she was going to do it. It was that simple. Yes, it sounds crazy. Part of it actually made sense to me. I don't get the why or how she tried it, but I got that it seemed to work in areas of numbing her pain and helping her sleep. So it did make sense when she kept using it because I actually saw it firsthand her sleeping and finally getting some pain relief. She wasn't an insomniac and on Xanax for years for sleep. It wasn't helping anymore, hence why she kept taking more and more. 
Lynn did what she wanted, when she wanted, and how she wanted. She was 62 years old and wouldn't listen, listen to me or anyone for that matter. Even my mom called her because I had told her about the gun and situations while she was in the hospital. There were a lot of things I am sure my mother would have talked about had she had the chance to testify. And I am sure, not sure why my attorneys did not argue against the state's motion to exclude her testimony. Instead, they decided not to call her to testify. Everyone assumes because she was my mom, she would lie to protect me, but that is not my mom, nor would I want that or ask that of her. When I did wrong years ago and got my forgery charges, it was my mom who turned me in. It wasn't easy for her, but she was... She knew I was in the wrong and I needed to be held accountable. My mom knew Lynn. She was her best friend and she knew me, her own daughter. It was a huge blow to my defense that nobody got to hear from her or what she knew or didn't know for that matter. My mom tried with Lynn nonstop until my mom couldn't deal with it anymore. I tried with Lynn. I talked to her all the time. That is why she did a lot of things I did not agree with when I wasn't around. When she died, Visine wasn't even on my mind because she was drinking it for months. That was according to her. I didn't see it for months. I only saw it shortly before the hospital stay. I was the one who wanted an autopsy and answers. I wanted to know if the doctors had missed something in all that time, if she really was sick or if, she had, or if it was in her head. It had gotten to the point where we no longer knew if it was her or the doctors because it didn't make sense how they weren't finding things wrong, yet all she did was complain. And then she would leave the hospital before she got answers or refuse tests. If she did this, if, she had been, if I had been back sooner that day, could I have gotten help or what had really happened? Even the story of cancer, she had it, then she didn't. I really didn't know what to believe anymore. I called the medical examiner for answers, absolutely. It really affected me because I was always around, and then to find her dead, I had to know what happened. I needed answers, and I could not let it go. I went back to her condo that night. Yes, I did, because the scene was cleared, and I was contacted by the police. Her cats were locked in a bedroom where the police had put them while they were there. Months later, I did, a lie, I did lie again about somebody giving me Visine in a drink. How could I say had what had really happened? I had spent months emptying her condo, taking care of all of her stuff, and I haven't even processed her death, yet I was going through all the motions. I kept dreaming she'd come home wondering where all her stuff was and getting mad. It was Christmas, the first holiday we had had that we had usually celebrated together, and I had tried to keep myself busy. After I was going through the boxes of hers in our basement, I had came across her suicide letters. I had put them aside and forgot all about them, out of mind, out of sight. I didn't really know what they were when I had first found them. But when I did find them, Anthony had testified. He said he didn't want to read or look at them. So I sat in the basement reading them. I cried, I was angry, and shocked to learn all that I did mostly about her mom's death and what she was going through. And that's when I fully learned about Visine, and only then did I research it. I never looked it up before that day. Yes, prior, I knew Lynn drank it, but only to release her pain and help her sleep, as she had said. I was lost with all this new information. Within a week or two, at most, I had went out with friends to watch a live band. I had overdrank and came home. I was in my feelings. I was thinking of Lynn and how she would have loved going to watch a live band like that back in the day. How she would still be here. How, how she should still be here. Her suicide letters, life, all of it. I had missed her. I was mad and angry over all of it. I wanted to relate to her. I wanted to understand why she had done the things she had did. Most of all, I wanted to be close to her again. I was trying to see what the Visine did or what, how it made her feel because I didn't get it. Nothing had made sense to me. And I was trying to make sense of it all. I don't know how else to explain it. I went to the bathroom and I drank Visine. I went and sat outside crying before finally going to bed. I woke up the next morning sick and not feeling good. I was to take Scott's youngest son, who I adored and loved, to a birthday party. I was mad at myself because I couldn't take him. I had cherished the time we had had with him on weekends. And I didn't know how to tell Scott. So again, I did. I lied. How could I explain? Do you know how I struggled? How many times I wanted and needed to talk to Scott about Lynn? How many times I couldn't sleep or woke up in the middle of the night and would go outside and sit crying because I loved him and I lied about Lynn as she had wanted and it had gotten so out of control and I couldn't talk to him. Then later, when I was arrested, I no longer knew what to believe myself. After all Lynn had said and the suicide letters, I didn't know what to say or not to say. Who would believe me because it was too much? How do you explain all I knew? 
I knew I didn't help her. I didn't take her life, and I believed that they would realize and figure out I wasn't involved. Then they brought up the vaccine, and I was afraid because I did buy it for her, at her request, with other regular grocery items, when I went, her, did, went and did her shopping. I didn't go to the store just for Visine. Then they started questioning on financials, and due to my past record, it didn't really matter what I said. They had their minds made up. I asked, offered, and took a polygraph test at my own request, not theirs. To this day, I have never been given those results or have seen them. This case came about for two reasons. First, because of who's Lynn, who Lynn's distant cousin was. He was a prior district attorney for none other than here, Waukesha County. He had no relationship with her, and when she passed, he read about it in the paper. He inquired by calling and coming in, in person, to the medical examiner's office. He was given my name and my number by the medical examiner because I found her. He never contacted me. He turned around and C-capped me. I never called him, and when, and when she passed, I never called him when she passed because I did not know of him, nor was he on her personal list of who to contact. The second reason was from him C-capping me. My prior forgery convictions, he said, and I quote, it did not pass the smell test because I was on her will. It didn't matter that I admitted to those charges back then, served my time, or changed my life since. Now, years later, or a decade later, they were brought back up in my face, nor did it matter that she, too, had had her own lengthy record. Lynn's cousin, his name is John, her ex-boyfriend Jim, and Anthony all came in person, called multiple times, and spoke with different people here, from deputies, sheriffs, detectives, people in the medical examiner's office, probate office, and even judges. Some were even friends of theirs or acquaintances, asking questions and voicing concerns, pointing fingers at us, my mom and I. There was so much done behind the scenes that this is not normal, and for that matter, appropriate, but it still happened, and none of that was talked about either during trial. The cousin did not know Lynn, or us for that matter, but he was sure to repeatedly voice his opinion of her friends, while the two main detectives laughed and joked with him about his prior time in office and how he was such good friends with the sheriff. The detectives told him he owed them a favor, and if he could talk to their boss for them and get raises in early retirement. Those detectives went to speak to him about an investigation into his cousin's death that he pushed, and they were laughing and joking with him how he owes them a favor, and no, I am not kidding. Those same detectives went and told my family and my friends I confessed, which I never did. They told them that I stole money from her, which I did not. They told them that I am a con artist and the worst of the worst, and I pry on people who have no one. Had them believe them, there was a chance that I even poisoned them. They asked them if they knew why I was on probation and told them it was for stealing $35,000 from my grandmother, and it goes on and on, which is all incorrect and not true. Let me tell you, these things did not come from my family or friends telling me this. They came from me reading and listening to my own recordings in my discovery that I have listened to. My own friends believed everything these detectives told them at face value. Why? Because they are cops and they would not lie, they said. Well, they did lie many times about a lot and even on the stand. So let's be clear, it was not just me who lied in this case. People think because they are cops, they tell the truth. Like they can do no wrong. Well, let let me guess again, because they do do wrong, just like anybody else. You see it every day. These detectives' evaluations and conclusions of this case were reached based upon their own biases, and the bias from the cousin of a former district attorney, where normal conclusions should have been based on an objective analysis of the evidence. I feel their jobs, as well as the others involved, made them vulnerable to official influence. Nobody has a clue what it is like being locked up for something you know you did not do. The more you speak to the detectives, how much they repeat the same question 20 different ways. I was losing my mind as they twisted and turned everything I said. It is crazy. They literally had me start thinking and believing I actually did something wrong when I knew I didn't. And they were so caught up on what they believed that it didn't matter that there was no evidence, no proof. Once their mind is made up, they were determined that what you say no longer matters because they won't believe you. The detectives were laser focused on me, where they never looked at this case objectively to view all possibilities. It took me four attorneys for someone to listen and get handwriting analysis done. I was the one who requested that. We got the FBI because I pushed for it, because I did not write those checks or suicide letters. 
and I wanted to prove it. We didn't hire an ordinary expert, we got the FBI. Why didn't the state bother to have those looked at or checked when they had years prior to do so? But yet, once again, once we got the FBI, the state tried to tell them that they requested their help. No, they did not. I did. They had even more of Lynn's writing that would have helped, but they chose not to send it off or even offer it to us to use. Do you know the state requested financial and phone records on Lynn, my mom and I, before they requested medical records? The state and the MA didn't even have or obtain her hospital records, nor did they even request them for that matter until six months after her <coughs> death. I was a suspect in her death before they ever requested those records. Tell me how that makes sense. They didn't think it was important or part of her death to know why she was in the hospital or what had all happened to her those two weeks she spent there, considering she was released only five days before she passed. They never took me to the park when I repeatedly asked. They said there was evidence to help me. Why not tell them? So when I finally did, yet they wouldn't take me to find it, why? To this day, nobody has ever personally taken me to the park. Why? Are they afraid that I might be right? I have had eight different attorneys, and not one has even tried to put in a motion requesting the judge to allow it. They claim I did this. Why didn't I take out a life insurance policy on Lynn? Remember, as they say, I killed her for money. As the state said, I was stealing money from her for over three years. Why did I call 911, stay on the scene? Why did I call wanting answers from the medical examiner? I was on probation and told my agent I had police contact. I called 911 and found her dead, that I was her personal representative and everything. I was under investigation for six months. If I was responsible and left in the public for almost a year after her death before I was arrested, better yet, I never ran. I could have been long gone. I had almost had a year out, but I didn't. I had no reason to. I came in to talk to the detectives. I called for answers. None of this makes sense, none. I have played the what ifs for over five years now from that day I found her on October 5th, 2018. <clears throat> Nobody knows how I wish I knew what I know now. I wish I was back sooner. I wish I had tried harder to get her help long before that day. Told the hospital and the doctors more. Done more, period. I live with those regrets. But as I sat here, sit here from the beginning to now, and however many years from now it takes, I will not stop fighting because I was wrongly convicted by this crooked, corrupt, and biased county. They only put out what they wanted and allowed you to hear. And they also changed things to fit the story to use against me. My trial attorneys were not able to bring up Lynn's mother's death, which was a large reason Lynn took her own life, as she stated in her own words, in her own suicide letters, which were admitted in trial but not discussed, where Lynn explains how she poisoned her mother with Visine and how it has haunted her ever since. You heard those today at the beginning from me. Those detectives looked into her mother's death, subpoenaed multiple med medical records, some were never turned over, yet we couldn't ask or bring any of it up during trial. Again, I was on trial fighting for my life. We can't bring up how the deceased, Lynn, killed her own mother years prior when it was similar to how she took her own life and why, if not all, of why she took her life. How is that fair? I should be able to defend myself fully when these were the letters Lynn left and those were the things she wrote in them. Yet the state can bring up my old forgery charges I had over a decade ago. The state has been allowed to speak and put out anything in the media from the beginning, but I have been silenced by a protective order the courts gave me even after my conviction. The state, along with Anthony, held a press conference immediately after I was found guilty, and I still wasn't allowed to speak. But when I had put out a brief statement after the state's submission of fake letters, trying to defend myself because nobody else was speaking out for me, I was reminded by the courts of that protective order and being in violation. This is insane. I haven't been able to speak witness, to witnesses, yet other witnesses have spoken to others, changing their stories to match. Hell, even the neighbor Jean, who personally knew and never met, who personally knew or met Anthony or Corrine prior to Lynn's death, but sometime before trial became friends with them, when I had regular contact with her before and after Lynn's death. She was who I called sometimes to check on Lynn if I couldn't be there or if she was having a bad day to go over or if I was going out of town or if Lynn fell and I needed help. We talked about Lynn a lot. Then I had people who knew Lynn in situations that later refused to testify or said they didn't know things on the stand that they prior did because I am all over the media and who wants to defend somebody accused of a murder charge? No business is going to back me or person wants to defend me even if it's the right thing to do, or if they know 
and have information to help. It is not right and it is not fair. I was allowed to be plastered all over court TV and the media like a circus show. These are real people's lives. This is not okay. It is Lynn's life, my mom's life, and my own life on public display. Yet what's being displayed is not accurate or even close to the truth. You think because they report it and it's the news that it's what they say is true? It's all about ratings and what people think they want to hear. Forget the truth or displaying the full story. This case was highly hyped up and sensational in the headlines due to the visine aspect. But it was also extremely and purely a circumstantial case with no physical evidence to back it. Yet the jury chose to convict me. And you want to talk about every defendant has the right for representation and a fair trial? That's all crap. You can't afford representation. You have to hope and pray because you are given representation from the state public defender's office. How many public defenders or attorney did I go through? Eight. Eight, and to date, none of them have done, have done enough for me. And then everything is funded by their office too, which is all from the state, which is the same one who is against you. During trial, the state asked our experts about their payment and how much they were paid to testify. Truth is, everyone in my trial, including witnesses and jurors, are paid. They are all paid by the state, county, the same as the district attorneys, their experts, medical examiners, detectives, my attorneys, and my experts. So if you think the state has an unfair advantage because they are trying to portray it like that by saying my experts are being paid for, well, of course they are. They have a job to do like everyone else, and they aren't being paid to lie or change what they believe. Their lives and reputations are on the line. If anything, it is harder for me, the defense, because the state doesn't like to offer much money for the defense to hire experts. They are very limited versus the state who can get all and have all and what they need. Our experts were paid their fee to look at this case and give their honest opinion of what the evidence shows and where it leads them and then to explain how and why they came to that conclusion. My own defense team during trial, well, let's be clear here, Anyone who watched my trial or saw in person, my trial attorneys were inadequate to say the least, in a nice way. I will say they did offer some good, whether it be finding the right experts or so forth. These people were given my life, my case to represent, while I watched frustrated on the sidelines. Nobody has a clue, unless you or somebody you know has been through it. It is very hard to defend yourself while sitting in jail. You can't do anything for yourself. You have to rely on other people, and that is hard because at the end of the day, they go home. It doesn't affect them while I sit. As of today, I said, I've had eight, trial, eight attorneys total. There was so much that was never done, records never obtained, people never spoken to, and on and on. It is so frustrating because I wanted these. I asked and asked, what was I to do? I have even wrote the courts on things. Half of those never made it to you. And when you responded, I never got anything in writing. I had to have my friends or family seek out for a response. I was always told to talk to my attorneys or my attorney has to do this or that. The problem is they weren't, they haven't, none of them. How am I to do these things when I am physically, when I physically can't or am not allowed? It does not make sense here. We are talking about murder charges. This is just sick how nobody cares. Nobody does anything and there is only so much my friends and family can do. I sit here upset, frustrated, angry because nobody gives a damn at how screwed up and wrong this is. I came to court numerous times on things I was told was incorrect or lying regarding issues in jail, my attorneys, discovery, closed during trial, so forth. I have tried to speak up in court only to be told I can't because I have an attorney to go through. But again, they weren't doing anything. As of late, I again was told that when I came to transcripts back in December, when my trial attorneys were released, you stated that you were going to request those transcripts. Then versus waiting for appeal because when a new attorney comes on, Board, they will need to review everything and you were trying to speed up the process so they wouldn't wait or have to request them and then stated that hopefully they can use trial video too since it is available and would be quicker. Later when I inquired about those transcripts I was told that you never said that and I was wrong. I am sorry but I am not lying or wrong. I know what I heard. I completely understand there are a lot of cases going on and the DA's attorneys and judges are all busy and may forget some things. But I assure you, I only have one case. This is my whole life that is on the line for. I know what I heard, and I also wanted those transcripts too because there was things I wanted to personally review and check on. I can't go back and look at the record as easily as others, nor can I do anything for myself except ask others who were in the courtroom to verify what I heard, which I did, 
but waiting and counting on attorneys when they aren't helping, responding, listening, or caring, frankly, is beyond frustrating. Everyone keeps passing it on to the next person. I was told by one of my trial attorneys he would send me copies of our last day in court when he was released that I have requested for over a year of my discovery. He said not to worry. He would make sure he sent them. I have wrote him three times, and he never sent them. Then I was also told by the public defender's office they would try to get me trial video, even after they had to step down, but never got that either. I wrote the supervisor, Jeremy, recently and never received a response. It is my understanding I still have seven to eight boxes of my trial, discovery, and notes, etc., sitting in the public defender's office. They are not even handling my case right now because of a conflict, yet they have my discovery still in their office. Then let's talk about my team versus the state's. I went to trial, and the state had five people who sat at the state's table during trial, three assistant district attorneys, and let's not forget the two detectives on standby, plus half the gallery on the state side, full of others from the district attorney's office, coming to watch like it's a show or run out to get whatever they need any second. What a fair fight. I got two attorneys and another who helped fill in. None even got to know Lynn or me, and that's my best shot, my best chance. It's not right, and... It's not right. How fair do you think, do you possibly think it looks to a jury? Then the discovery issues. With today's technology, most of mine was electronic and put on a drive that I was not allowed to keep in my possession. So I had to request it in the jail when I wanted and wait to get, which I did not agree with. It should be in my possession at all times. Anyone can view and look at it in the jail or do whatever they want with it. It was lost numerous times. It was just a few weeks ago. Again, nobody could find it, and an officer and lieutenant even searched. My first attorneys were the ones who first put all my discovery together on a drive, so trying to talk to my trial attorneys and find the same things when I have no copies to compare. I wasn't allowed to bring it on a visit with them to try and view on their computer. I wasn't able to show them on the video's visit things either, since there is no computer to show them documents I am talking about and vice versa nor could I release the drive to them. The few minutes you gave us during lunch or at the end of the day during trial was when some of those things were first went over or the first time they saw things that I had pointed out. It was when I could actually go over things side by side with my attorneys, and that was during trial, and it was too late. It was a huge issue in my due process right to effectively assist in my own defense when I was not able to properly view my discovery with my attorneys. To date, some documents I have never seen or received some I couldn't even open because of the computers available in the jail to view my discovery, doesn't have the programs needed to open the documents. I found things during trial on my attorney's computer in that time that I could have done prior but had no access. Then you should see all I have found since trial ended in my discovery. Even I am shocked that my own team attorneys never found or saw it prior to bring up. Sometimes it would just be nice to do something for yourself, seems it is my life that I am fighting for, and I know the case, situation, and our lives better than anyone else. Attorneys have other clients. As much as I want to be the one, the only one, and the case they are working on, I am not. But again, when I am fighting a charge I didn't do for murder, and it carries a life sentence, I have a very limited time to go over my case. It is beyond frustrating. I know most attorneys say we don't come to visit or speak to you often because it's time taken away from working on your case. But in reality, you can't fully work on a case when you don't know much or have facts that you can't get all the facts without me because you don't know us. You can't know us by just paper, as the state tried to. Early on, I couldn't even call around looking for an attorney because the jail doesn't have a phone book, which nowadays I get but they should at least provide an attorney legal directory, and they don't. You have to rely on friends and family to do everything, and thank God I have some left. But what would those do? What about those who don't? And not to mention, it's not on your friends and family to do. When I was first being interrogated, I did ask about getting an attorney and how to go about that. The detective said I needed to call an attorney, and when I asked how and the issues, they said to go through family. The way I see it, they make it that way so you get no help because that's what they want. Even the public defender's office won't answer a collect call from the jail. You have to pay for it. Do you know how many people don't have the $4 it is for a jail phone call? And it's never just one call. You need multiple. You are put on hold and passed around. And while on that subject, I did call the public defender's office when I was first arrested back in July 2019. And do you know nobody would help me? When I, they went to look me up, 
I wasn't charged with anything. I was on probation, on a probation hold. They said if and when I was charged, or if my probation proceeded with revocation, they would be notified and come and see me. So as far as getting help or knowing what to do or speaking with someone, I got nowhere. So yes, I did drop slips to see the detectives after my first interrogation because I did nothing wrong and nobody else was helping. I had nothing to hide and figured if I spoke to them, they would realize they were wrong. I ended up writing and waiting over two weeks on multiple phone calls to the public defender's office before I finally got someone to come and see me. And then I had already hired an attorney after my mom called around, but it was too late. If there is any advice I have for anyone, whether you did something wrong or not, do not speak to anyone without an attorney. They use everything and anything against you. They make you feel you did wrong, even when you did. They play mind games. They lie. It is all so wrong how they continue to get away with it. Everyone watched hours of my interrogations, but the truth is there was so much that was edited out, so much more that people never got to see. Again, it is only what they wanted you to see and hear. For the last five years, everything I do is monitored, whether it is mail, phone, or visits. Granted, I have nothing to hide, but while I was fighting my case and going through trial, it is not right because the state made sure to listen to it all. And then fair trial, well, that's all crap too, because if it were, we would have been able to put out a full and fair trial presenting all the facts and evidence instead of it being a one-sided story by the state. I am sorry, but this is wrong, and I am paying for something I did not do, and I will have to wait years fighting an appeals process because I did not receive a fair trial. I didn't get my due process right to present my full defense to the jury. To what I watched in shock while sitting at my four-week trial, and I am the only one, I am not the only one who feels this way. I have heard and listened as plenty of people in the public agreed, many who didn't even know me or Lynn, but said that this case did not make sense. I was railroaded, that I didn't get a fair fight, and I am saying I didn't, and I know I didn't. I cried and screamed every day at my attorneys. So much was missed, so much was not heard, so much was lost in translation. Nobody understands TV shows of people on trial is nothing like actual trials. Nobody should be plastered on TV. Not their trials, their court hearings, their cases, etc. None of it. People think because they saw me on TV, they know me. Well, they do not. Some say I like attention. Let's be very clear, I do not. Not even one bit. It's, very, it's quite embarrassing. It's hard, it's frustrating, it's a mess. I got people judging me on what they see, making assumptions, talking about me, saying this or that, and I try not to care what people think, but some days it just hits me, and I do, because it's, it isn't me. I didn't do this. Or the others who pass by and whisper, there goes the eye drop killer, or ID murder, and this and that. I don't care for any of those titles, nor is it me. I am super emotional. I cry a lot because it is a lot I am going through. During trial, I had to hide a lot of that, per my attorneys, and that was hard. During breaks, I would cry, and I was told to clean myself up because they didn't want the jury or cameras to see me like that. This is me. I am human, and this is all so much. Why can't I show who I am? Do you know the day I was convicted in jail in the pod I am housed in? The other inmates sat watching on TV. The correctional officer laughed and said what a joke I was. How I was fake crying. How if you held a cup to my eyes, it would be empty. This is no joke. This is my, not funny. This is my life. And I am being held responsible for taking the, her own life, take, for Lynn taking her own life. And people make a joke out of it. Nobody gets it. Nobody has a clue what my family, my friends, or more importantly, what my mom and I have or are currently going through. There are major issues the jury never got the chance to hear, all relative, relative, relevant, and important testimony. And also the jury had before it evidence not properly admitted was so obscured a significant issue that it may be fairly said that the real controversy was not fully tried. The state claimed I was a lying, greedy murderer. That is what they said this case was about. They want you to believe this case was a homicide and that it was all about money and visine. Let's be very clear here. There was no murder. I did not commit murder. I did not poison Lynn, give her pills, or anything else. She either committed suicide or died from an accidental overdose. I was not greedy. I never took a dollar from Lynn, ever. Nor did Lynn die from Visine. That's what they want you to believe, because clearly having 40 to 50 pills in her system is normal. The combination of those pills alone could kill somebody. Then let's add her ailments and medical issues, too. You heard the medical examiner and the pathologist list off a ton of things. 
interstitial mitosis, I don't even know, hypertension, hepatotic cytosis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a combination of bacopolopin, ropinamol, alprazolam, hydrocodone, and cybobenzaprine use. But no one, but no, the state says it's just visine because it couldn't have been there. It shouldn't have been there. The ME stated on the cause of death, states exhibit 36, she died from tetrahydrazine or THZ poisoning, manner of death, homicide. As stated on the death certificate, this fatal injury occurred at an unknown time, at an unknown date, when the decedent was given THZ by another. The ME doesn't know what day or the time she died, but can say she died by THZ given to her by another. How can she say that when it did not happen? And for that matter, there is no proof, no evidence, because none exists since it didn't happen. There was no fingerprint evidence, no DNA evidence, no visine bottle taken, no water bottle taken, no plate taken, no spoon taken, no nothing taken for that matter, except some medication bottles. There was no physical evidence for this case. Then they say the scene was staged with crushed pills. Funny, because those same pills were in her tox screen. Also odd was the affidavits the very own detectives used and wrote to get records. State the plate of crushed pills was on the victim's chest or stomach, yet the picture shows them on the side table. I wonder how they got there and how fragments of those pills got on Lynn's chest. Maybe, just maybe, that happened when the medical personnel put the electrical pads on her upper body. They moved the plate, hence spilling some of the fragments. Seen as a lot of things were moved, because we saw that by pictures, not like they first took pictures, then moved items to try to save her life. No, they moved the items they needed to access her to try to save her life. Then they took pictures after the fact. Just like the spoon, whole pills, and the silver containers lying on the floor next to Lynn, those were on the plate on her chest when I found her, not lying on the floor in the mess around her. Just like the ME said pill fragments were in her hair and shoulders. No pictures show that, nor do any reports from the deputy medical examiner. And she was the actual one on the scene, not the ME. The jury placed greater value on the testimony of the police and the state's experts than on findings of the defense's two experts, one of whom has extensive knowledge in Visine and both who have seemed more knowledgeable than that of the state's own medical examiner. The jury chose to convict on a life sentence charge when there was no physical evidence, not single one piece. This case was purely 100% circumstantial. I was asked the other day by a family member, if there was no Visine in her system, what would have happened, meaning what would they have then claimed she died from? I am wondering the same thing. What would they have used against me then? The only part they got right was I lied. I did, yes. I lied over and over about Lynn, at Lynn's request and after, because I no longer knew what I believed myself. I also tried very hard not to tell anyone about her mother's death because I saw no reason in that, nor was it my place. Hell, I wish I never found out. I didn't want to destroy memories of Lynn with the bad for others. I felt nobody needed to know about Lynn's mother's death or what part she was involved in it, because they chose to take things this far, knowing I did not do this. I had no choice but to tell and share her letters. I have very few people left in my life, and yes, that happens too when you have been locked up a long time like I have. It can be very hard, but then I realized if those people don't believe me and walked away, then they weren't who I thought, nor are they people I need in my life. You really see who you can count on when things get tough and who's still around for you. What people don't understand or know is before all this, I was happy. I was in love with a good man and his kids. They were my whole world. I planned a life with him and we spent our time with friends and with the kids. We were very social. In the summer, we did traveling softball with his teenage daughter and his little one. I love spending time with them. The state tried to make this case about, about fighting by trying to make sense of our text messages. Yeah, so we had some arguments. Who doesn't in a relationship? But let me tell you, they were not anything like what was portrayed. We lived together. We spent most of our time together, and we had a good relationship. Yes, we gambled. We went out drinking with our friends at our friends' bars. So what's the big deal? I'm not sitting here and trying to say we didn't, nor was it our whole lives. We also took a trip to the Dells, as the state said. 
We were to go to the Virgin Islands, but a hurricane derailed that a week before, and we were to leave, and it took over a month to get refunded. Refunded. We had the time off from our work, so we had decided to go away for an extended weekend, and Lynn offered and treated for a hotel that weekend. I was also on the phone with her often that weekend because she was super sick. And yeah, we had some great Christmases. I went all out for those kids, absolutely. The last year, we had just won $72,000 from Potawatomi, the month before. So they got even more that year. I did spoil them. I don't have kids of my own, and anyone who knew me knew I always wanted them. So his were as close as I got. I didn't steal her money to buy or get them things, ever. The state has taken every single thing out of context and made it into something it wasn't. None of this matters or had anything to do with Lynn's death. Scott ended up in the ER months before, months after Lynn died and was the one who, I was the one who fought to get him to the doctor, called around and get an appointment sooner. I was the one who took him. I ended up having, he ended up having emergency surgery, his sinuses were blocked, and he talked to his ex-wife while there and had a will done. He was afraid I'd be mad he listed his kids and not me. Never in a million years would I have cared or wanted different. I was clo close with both his exes and the kids' moms and his family. I was happy in life with him and those kids. I had a job I loved, I made good money, and had great hours. It, bro it breaks my heart I lied to him. I not only lost Lynn, but I lost him and the kids. Our friends, I've lost everything including my life. There was no reason no amount of money ever in the world that would make the state say I don't care what the state says or try to say or prove they are wrong and then there's those I met here daily that are forever trying to get information get close or turn against me they think they know me. They whisper and talk about me. I trust so few and keep an even smaller circle. As I have said, I have nothing to hide, but me being all over the TV, I don't have to say a word. These people still try to make this up or that to help their own cases. I wouldn't wish this upon anyone. All I have been through upon anyone, including my worst enemy. I have spent months debating on what I was going to say here today or if I was even going to talk. There has been so much I wanted to say. I hope I got it all out. I needed to say all this for Lynn, for my mom, and for I, as well as others struggling in the system or with it. I am not good at keeping my mouth shut. Usually I'm very outspoken about my frustrations and wrongs that have happened in all this. But in closing, I wanted to share why and how I am still functioning and standing after all this time. What helps me wake up and face a new day? I want people to know how my life has changed for the better and why. I want people to know how my life has changed. I want people to know that there, there are everyday people struggling in similar or other situations if I have realized, as I have realized, and it could always be worse. I am grateful for what I do have. And know that I am blessed. Even when things are hard, there is always a blessing. Even when it doesn't feel like it, and if we don't see it, sometimes it's a blessing in disguise. I have had so many blessings in disguise looking back that I didn't even realize at the time. Like early on, they were good. Like early on, when I was struggling with firing my first two attorneys, everyone kept saying they were good, and I'm crazy to fire them. But they did nothing for me. I went months with no contact and finally decided it was time. I got an attorney who believed in me and helped me and pushed for handwriting analysis. And we got the FBI. Or like when I lost another one of my attorneys early on due to another inmate turning against me. I ended up with another who was even better and who helped me get a pathologist when my other attorney said I couldn't get the funding. I could go on and on, but I am still alive. And that alone is a blessing. I woke up today. God gave me another day. So for that, I want to use this remaining time in closing and all the media coverage for some good. I hope everyone realizes life is too short. Don't forget to tell those you love every chance you can. Don't sweat the small stuff. 
and live every day as it's your last because tomorrow is not promised. If you know str somebody's struggling, be there for them. Get them help. Mental health is real. Don't wait until it is too late or you will forever regret it. Do you know if you were to die here today where you will go? I ask that because I do, but most don't. I spend a lot of days wondering if Lynn ever got right with God and if she is in heaven, and that is hard. I hope one day I get to see her again. Until then, I have to keep fighting because the truth self shut me free. Freedom, after all, is about remaining in truth. God made us with dignity and gave each of us free will, and we will always have a choice about our attitude. We can remain in Christ no matter where we are. As I said, the truth is I did not kill Lynn. I have played the what-ifs over and over from the day I found her. One thing I have come to accept is that no matter what she did, I did, or anyone did differently, it wouldn't have mattered. That is something I have made peace with, and that was Lynn's last day on earth. She took her own life by suicide, or she accidentally overdosed. Regardless, God knew long before that that was the day she was going to die, and he knew how. It was predestined, so nothing was going to change it. This is how I was finally able to accept her being gone and was struggling with what more I could have done. Whether prior to that day or getting more help or coming back sooner or whatever else, it wouldn't have mattered. This is something most people do not realize. God knows us. He created us. He knows everything, including the day we were born to the day we die. He chose that for her, so nothing was going to change it. This is the part that is hard for us. It is the loss of her being it is the loss of her being here. It is that she is not here with us. I get that because anyone who knew her, I would hope would feel that. But that doesn't mean you can't ruin somebody else's life over what she did to herself. You can't change what actually happened to whatever version you want because you don't like the truth. You can't blame somebody for something they didn't do. You can't put that on somebody else. You just can't. It is a lot to be accused and convicted of murder when I didn't do it. It won't bring her back, and it won't make her loss any easier. You're holding me responsible for what she did. Those were her decisions, her choices, her actions, and no one else's. Not even mine. One of the hardest lessons in all this, God keeps showing me, we are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. But that is tough. I am trying more than anyone realizes, but mark my words when I say you are sending an innocent person to prison today. And when, not if, but when my appeal happens, my conviction is overturned, you will see that I was right and that I maintained my innocence from the beginning. And that can be on this county, this medical examiner, the detectives, the DA, the jurors, and you, Judge Doro. All of you will have to live with that. All this time I sat, I can't get back these five years I have lost. I won't ever be able to have kids as I have always wanted and have someone call me mom or be there for my grandparents in their remaining years or when they pass. My grandmother now has dementia, which I am almost grateful for because we were so close that this would be too much if she remembered or realized what was happening. At the beginning, beginning of this, she was there for me and would still be, she just doesn't understand or know what's really happening. She also knew Lynn very well and all her issues. It is very hard because I don't get to see or talk to her and be there for her. I don't remember the last time I got to hug her or my mom for that matter. It's been over four and a half years now. I have missed weddings and births and so much more. I haven't been outside or even seen the outside in almost three years because jail is not designed to house inmates long term. There's so much I am missing and can't be a part of, and even so much more to come. I kind of am working very hard on forgiving, but all, forgiving all, but it doesn't make any of this easier or right. I know, Lynn knows, and God knows, I did not do this. I can stand by that, because even though I don't have much faith in our justice system or this county, I do in God. Before, before all this, my faith or lack of, mostly because I did not make time for him to be a part of my life. I did believe in him prior, but that was about it. This situation gave me a lot of time to search for answers and question everything, and even now I still do. 
Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding because we aren't always meant to understand and sometimes what we go through is to learn from our trials and to be there or to be there for someone else's turn theirs or just to sit us down because we need to get something right. What I found is I want to be in control of me and my situation, but I am not, nor can I currently change anything. So I need to trust and give it all to God. This trust at times is hard and doesn't always come easily. The results may not be everything or anything I ever envisioned, but I have to continue to trust in God for he knows what he is doing. I always felt so alone, but I have come to realize I am not. Even now years later, I know I would not have survived all I have without God and his work. I still question a lot. I don't understand the whys and the struggle, but I can say without my faith, I would have taken my life long ago like Lynn. I have been through so much, and for what, I don't know. I do know, what I do know is I did not take Lynn's life. It is so unfair, but God has a reason, a plan, and a purpose for it all. I hope, no, I know, he will make this right in his time and his way. One of my favorite verses, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And I do believe, as I said, this all happened for a reason. And there is to be some good to come from out, out of all of this. So many people work to make this case about me and against me. But it is not the truth. During trial, the people who knew me said that this is not me. They didn't see this or think this or think I would do this. They questioned the police on a lot of things. They were lied to by both the police and even me. I don't hide that. But I... I don't hide that, but even they said that I was kind, nice, would do anything for anybody. They trusted me with their children. These same people were my friends. They testified for the state because I lied to them, yet they still said kind words about me. Why? Because that was me and is me. How often does that happen for the state's own witnesses? Lynn was my family. These so-called friends of hers were not around her last years. I was, and even being around her daily, there is so much I didn't see or know. Nobody in this case actually bothered to spend the time to getting to know Lynn, my mom, or I enough to talk about us, prosecute us, or even defend us. Even after all I have been through, I still love and miss her every day. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, as I have been learning, it doesn't matter who is against us. It can be everything, everyone, and sometimes it seems like it. But as long as I have God in my life, it doesn't matter because that's all anyone needs. He will be my strength, my defender, and my protector. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So you can say all and do all you want to me. Even after being convicted, the state is still trying, but try as they might. We all saw months back when the state turned over some letters days prior to my sentencing to make me look bad, and it backfired. When they, when they can't even make sense of them or what they had clearly showing that was a setup or someone framing me. Remember they said the envelope that was folded in half, stamped by the jail, but not mailed, hand-delivered with letters asking somebody to make a tape? Even though I know there's still a tape out there in Lynn's voice, as anyone who knew her would know her voice, but nobody wants to take me to find it or get it in Whitnell Park. And to make notarized papers, when I know, because I was with Lynn at the bank, when she got papers notarized, they keep logs of what they notarize. Nor can you make a fake notary. So I would ask somebody to do that. Why? Again, I am in jail with cameras all over. As we saw, this is just added in. As we saw um, Amy today on the tape, there was an envelope. I've never denied an envelope. If anybody would bother to speak with attorney Kukler, who was my attorney, it was sent to her, and it is to her, and it was for everything done wrong during trial. I know they listen to the tapes. I know they listen to my recordings, and it says that. I have never denied sending out an envelope, and Amy took it to the desk to see her boyfriend who was next door. I have never changed that. You also state that there was a J on the envelope. My first name starts with a J, just to be clear. Why don't you start looking at the detectives, jail staff, or other inmates? Because this crap is getting old. Oh, that's right. They already had. They made other inmates make up stories on me and on this envelope, too. Again, why? Because they want a better deal for themselves on their own cases. Amy was also sentenced the day before she had spoke to the detectives. Why not ask the former inmate who lied on the stand how she is doing? Well, I will tell you. She is back in jail in more trouble, so I am sure she has or will reach back out 
trying to offer some more made up information for you to help or better yet, why not ask the detectives to reach out offering promises because they have done that multiple times. I have a friend who was willing to write on my behalf because they tried that with her. Her uncle is an attorney. She had no information to give them and they repeatedly told her that they would offer her a deal or get her into treatment sooner. I asked repeatedly to be allowed to go to Whitnall Park where those items were buried by me for police to take me to the park. To this day, nobody has taken me, nor have my attorneys tried to get the judge to allow it either. They said they took a videotape. Also on that tape, is it frozen in time multiple times? Nobody has physically taken me out of custody to get it, and I don't understand why. The time, energy, and money, the time, energy and money that was spent on pre-sentence investigation reports that were done for my sentencing could have been put towards finding that evidence or something more important that would have actually benefited my trial or case when we all know those reports say what those reports say won't change the outcome of your sentence here today. How many other people have been convicted because of one reason or another, nobody bothered to look for crucial evidence still there and waiting to be discovered? You then say you can use those letters against me for sentencing. How is that right? I am not charged with those or even convicted, but you want and can use that against me. So again, as I said, what can mere mortals do to me? You can all say or do what you want to me. Even after being convicted, the state is still trying, but try as they might. I am sure they will keep doing all they can, as I know I will too. It will not silence me. It will not break me, nor will it change that I did not take her life. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Two weeks before my sentencing, I had a meeting with my attorney regarding restitution. The state is requesting almost $400,000 in restitution in an 86 page document that was submitted to the courts that was under seal where even I can't get a copy to thoroughly go through it. I did review it with my attorney briefly, but have not been able to thoroughly go through it. But I was to agree or dispute within two weeks. How am I to do that without exactly thoroughly going through it? These numbers and figures that all came out in trial, so I am not sure why it is a secret and sealed. Yet the envelope with the fake letters brought up prior to jail, not from the jail, not mailed from the jail, mailed from the jail, who knows, was submitted to the courts at sentencing materials before my prior sentencing date, and that wasn't talked about during trial, nor wasn't talked about trial, but that was sealed. That was not sealed. It makes no sense. They can again pick and choose who sees and hears what they want and what they can't. But it is up to my attorneys to request to seal something. But again, I do not I did not have attorneys working for my best interests or doing anything at that time. They were too busy saving themselves to help me, talk to me, or file anything on be my behalf except withdrawal. And because I had counsel listed on record, I could not do anything for myself with the courts or get another attorney to. Defendants are at a huge loss to try and defend themselves or help in their own defense. It is damn near impossible, and that is unacceptable. It needs to change. There is no such thing as all defendants are to be considered innocent until proven guilty by the court of law. I was guilty from the beginning and never had a proper and fair chance to prove my innocence. So do your best, but I am still standing. I am still fighting, and I will not give up, as God is my witness. This case is far from over. You may think by convicting me and sentencing me that it is, but it is not over by a long shot. Until my conviction is overturned and my name is cleared, I will not rest, as I know neither will Lynn. I know a lot of people may have things to say since I have talked about God, but that is between me and God. I know as you sit here, you're probably thinking you've been convicted. Yes, I have, but I also know there are people who have been imprisoned who were wrongly convicted for crimes they did not commit. It happens, and it did happen in this case. I was advised to expect and prepare myself for you to hand on a sentence of life without parole, but even in judgment, God is merciful. So I ask you, put aside what many others are expecting and asking of you, and to leave the outside influences of media and politics behind as you have seen, heard, and know more of the facts and circumstantial evidence of this case than most. As I stand before you, or sit, I am asking you to be fair, just, and merciful with my sentence today, because even though I was convicted, my innocence will prevail in God's time. 
Here at Waukesha County Jail, where I have been incarcerated for over two years, I started reading to the whole pod before bed nightly devotions and prayers to the ladies when someone was to be released, whether they were headed home, another jail, prison, or treatment. I would share one of my favorite verses, which is Joshua 1, nine. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So I may be going to prison for now, but I will be okay. I will not be alone, and this is not the end of my story. I will continue fighting for Lynn's truth and mine. Thank you very much for your time today.